Uh, my name is Bipin. I'm based at Mahidol Oxford Tropical Medicine Research Unit uh, at Bangkok. Currently, I'm in Nepal. Uh, today, I'll be talking about One Health Approaches to AMR. Uh, basically, in these talks, I would like to cover what do we understand by One Health Approach in AMR and why is it important and share some studies from Nepal and then potential approaches to tackle the AMR, including some of the frameworks that we studied about. Uh, AMR burden, I think uh, previous speakers have already talked about the, uh, the burdens of AMR, uh, one of them uh, discussed by uh, Ben. The O'Neill report, uh, the projected deaths uh, if uh, appropriate actions are not taken is uh, alarming and WHO has already warned that we could step into post-antibiotic era if no actions are taken. So in this regards, it looks like AMR is a big problem. Uh, and then uh, stepping into AMR and discussing about AMR, uh, we cannot extricate human health uh, from animal and environmental health. Uh, One Health has been defined uh, heterogeneously in uh, different uh, literature and different resources uh, from different sources. But to me, One Health is an intersection between animal, uh, human, and uh, environmental health. Uh, so it, it allows us to, it reminds us that we cannot look uh, human health in isolation or with isolated lens. Uh, the major question is why should you be concerned about animal health or environmental health? Why can't we focus on human health? Because antimicrobials are widely used in sectors other than human health, uh, that include animal health and husbandry, agriculture, and generally food production. And as you know, increasingly over the years, we've seen air, water, and environmental pollution the infection and a reservoir as it acts to, uh, uh, you know, host resistant organisms is a major problem that can come back to human as well. And uh, from these reports, uh, you could see 60% of pathogens that cut human, that cause human diseases come from animal or wildlife. 75% of emerging human pathogens are of animal origin and 80% of pathogens that are of concern for bioterrorism are from animals. So with this, it leads to uh, some more concerns around uh, why should we uh, why should we adopt one health approach or why should we concern about animal and environmental health? Uh, uh, you might have read this book by David Quammen, uh, The Spillover. This is a fantastic book where David uh, has shared his experience of uh, visiting various forested areas in Africa and elsewhere, where he has walked thousands of miles with uh, alongside other scientists in uh, exploring how spillover must have happened. Uh, there he also uh, uh, adds uh, lots of descriptions and discussions uh, amongst uh, different scientists from different uh, sectors. Uh, one of them was Professor Donald Burke. Uh, his lecture in 1997 already predicted that uh, coronaviruses could be a potential, can lead to potential pandemic. Upon asking him, how could he predict that? Uh, uh, he uh, sarcastically, ironically said that that was just a guess, but in fact, the evolvability and the predictability by Donald Burke uh, did come true in 2003 first with SARS outbreak, and then uh, MERS outbreak in 2014, and the current COVID-19 is an alarming example of how much we should be concerned about animal health or the genetic disease in general. Just to show you pictorially how much connected we are with animal and environmental health, as antimicrobials are used uh, uh, substantially by humans and uh, animals as well. And for animals, especially for food production, uh, it, can, it can go in multiple different ways to humans uh, through manures that can contaminate the environment and then through sewers and water system that can come to humans. So, so moving on, uh, just to give you a, another glimpse of how uh, these uh, tiny compounds, if they if they behave abnormally, that can uh, topple the whole programs. Uh, for example, 1950s, 60s uh, historical uh, malaria eradication program or the ambitious plan by WHO to uh, adopt uh, malaria eradication was toppled by uh, uh, DDT resistance. So, uh, just trying to show here how much these tiny compounds or the, uh, the resistance to these tiny compounds can topple the whole programs. So just showing how much inextricably linked we are with uh, agriculture and animal health. Uh, here I'm trying to show our experience of uh, uh, the over-the-counter use of antibiotics used in Nepal. 
uh, we did uh, we did interviews with uh, various stakeholders. Obviously, this relates to human health only, uh, but we interviewed uh, patients, clinicians, and dispensers in various parts of Nepal. And obviously, you could guess uh, we found out that these uh, were uh, rooted to various different uh, meta themes like policies, uh, ambiguous policies. Although we did we did predict and we did guess, but it was not in that clarity that we could. Uh, we, we could guess. So we found out that it illuminated, it gave us massive insights how those uh, ambitious policies, ambiguous policies might have led to use of uh, over the counter use of antibiotics, including uh, other issues such as accessibility, costs, and uh, demand for antibiotics. Uh, so to, to our surprise, when we discussed these findings with different departments in Nepal, uh, we found similar uh, this this echoed with uh, other sectors as well, other sectors meaning animal and agriculture sectors, that use of antimicrobials was widespread and uh, knowledge about antimicrobial resistance was very low. So in this nationwide survey, um, uh, we found out that the use of antimicrobials, especially in poultry, chickens and animals was uh, used, although not much in agricultural sector. We, we then did a tiny review, a commentary, uh, how antimicrobial uh, are used in food animals and agriculture. This uh, echoed with our findings that antimicrobials uh, used in food animals are extensive compared to uh, the literature around agricultural products, although we, we are not sure how much of this has been reported or underreported. Uh, this led us to think about, so how should we tackle AMR then? This is a, of course, million dollar question. The answer to this question offers uh, a lot of promises, but unfortunately, we don't have a straightforward answer. As Sassy and others described, it is a complex problem. So we need, obviously, multi-sectoral collaboration that requires experts in a vast number of fields and from vast number of disciplines. Uh, in this uh, editorial on the right-hand side, we tried to uh, have this ambitious topic uh, to you know, get into a bottom-up, uh, how could we resolve or uh, tackle antimicrobial resistance? Uh, but then we ended up uh, uh, concluding that we need broaden we need to broaden the gates uh, that is Pastelli framework and existing framework that includes broader broader disciplines or broader uh, uh, dis uh, uh, sectors that should come together or that could offer insights to uh, in insights and solutions to fight uh, antimicrobial resistance rather than focusing on only human health. Uh, obviously, this boils down to why one health then. Uh, how do you implement One Health? As previous speakers have already described, uh, implementation science seem to offer uh, insights, and obviously I agree with them, uh, because when, we, when I looked into this topic and uh, I found very little literature about One Health that is being implemented or uh, conducted uh, in the countries, uh, one of these study in uh, Kenya on the right-hand side, uh, they showed that Rift Valley virus uh, morbidity and mortalities uh, before applying One Health approach and after applying One Health approach was significantly different. That is, it reduced the number of morbidities and mortalities, and uh, this looked very promising to me. Although uh, this study, uh, this programmatic implementation was uh, supported by CDC US, uh, lab supported by Cambry, technical supported by various other organizations, including it was a collaboration between three different ministries, ministries of health, agriculture, and then uh, animal health departments. So this obviously sounded very ambitious project. So, and then I came down to uh, uh, ponder about myself, why is it not working in Nepal then? Or is there any animal health, uh, One Health project in Nepal? I, yes, there is. There is animal uh, One Health task force. I discussed with some of the uh, authorities in ministries of health and all they shared with me was, there was lack of political commitment and lack of policy formulation and sustainable financing was lacking. So this led us to understand that there were lots of gaps, that the foremost thing and the, the proximal and the most important thing was the commitment from a uh, political side, and then the policy, and then the financing, uh, and then the rest of the others, such as capacity enhancement, which, uh, which all the way ran down to engaging communities. Because uh, some of our speakers also talked about how do we engage community members or behavior change that uh, some of the questions were there. So this led me to think that it needs a broader approach from top to the bottom and then from and, and, and then to engage community 
Uh, it uh, doesn't sound easy, but although it's complex, uh, it might offer us uh, some insights that we need broader uh, implementation science approach for future to, to implement One Health in future. So with this, I would like to acknowledge uh, contributors uh, to some of these studies that are presented here uh, and, and the collaborators here. Thank you.